Thank you, you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, hope you all uh, enjoyed a good cup of coffee in order to survive the last uh, three sessions or two, as I heard. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you a story about um, our developments towards a multi-user platform in the Brussels capital region. So I'm talking on behalf of the Brussels Capital Region and the saint Air Museum in Brussels. It's a collaboration between these two institutions. Before I tackle the subject, I'll first very briefly tell you some, something about um, yeah, the more geographical context so you all understand um, on what I'm, um, what I'm talking about. For the Belgian people in the audience, if there still are, at least my boss is still here, so I have to be very, uh, have to be very careful on what I say. I'll give a very sim simplific uh, explanation about the geographical um, situation in Belgium. And as you'll see, the political, the political geographical situation in Belgium is very easily, unless everything you've heard. Belgium is divided in three parts: the Flemish region, the Brussels capital region in green, so the little dot, and the Walloon region. Um, so I'm working for that little green spot in the middle and it's uh, located entirely in the Flemish region, but it has its own government. So <coughs> this Brussels capital region, as you can see, is divided in 24 ent 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 entities, yeah, entities, of which the central part over here is um, the historical town of Brussels. So the historical town of Brussels is one of these and 24 historical entities. Another one, as you all may have heard of, is the uh, commune of Molenbeek, Saint Jean Molenbeek. Apparently, you've heard something about it the last few months. Yeah. Um, so, everything we do, or, or my department, of the de or the department uh, for which I work, um, yeah, is, is working. Um, Excuse me. So, we're, everything that has something to do with archaeology within this region comes to uh, comes to us. So, before I tackle the the actual digitalization, I have to go back a bit in town in time because this process already started at the beginning of the uh, early nineties. So, in 1991, my colleagues or former colleagues, I didn't work uh, in Brussels at the moment back then. Was only four years old. <laughs> Maybe I could have no. Um, so, so they started to create this this the series, which consists of 24, 24 volumes, and in this series, um, which is called the Atlas, as you can read, of the archaeological potential of the Brussels capital region, and in these atlases, we create. A, um, an archaeological inventory of each commune, of each municipality. So of Molenbeek, of Anderlecht, of Laken. So of each commune, we create by, <coughs> by, um, uh, by a uh, multidisciplinary approach like cartographic research, archaeological research, historical re research, all kinds of researches, we create this inventory. So for each commune, we have these kind of maps on which we plot, on which we locate different possible archaeological sites. <coughs> sites that could have been disappeared, like a castle which, which stood there in the 14th century but has been disappeared afterwards, or a, a farm, or a, 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 a well, or whatever. So on these maps all these sites are located, together with, in orange, the uh, ancient road network, and the ancient waterways. So everything's put together. In pink, so these pink zones, this is what we call the extension zones of the archaeological sites. So we have the archaeological site, for example, the castle itself, but of course, the, the domain of the castle is a lot larger. So we, we create like these big, big zones, um, which have a high archaeological potential in them. Now, it's important to know that these atlases, these 24 volumes, you know, yeah, something like this, um, it's not only informative, it's more than that. It's, a, it's really it's a legal base uh, for the management of archaeological uh, heritage and the organiz organization 
of uh, preventive archaeology. So if an entrepreneur wants to um, wants to build something or wants to do infrastructure works within these pink zones, well, then there will be some kind of archaeological survey uh, done before the infrastructure works. That can be excavations or building archaeology or a follow-up of the site. Everything depends, of course, of the geography of the site, the type of site. Okay, I suppose this is quite clear. Uh, the white zones, well, that doesn't mean that these zones don't have archaeological potential. It merely means that, yeah, we don't know what kind of archaeological potential lays within these zones. Um, so, when, yeah, when an, um, an entrepreneur wants to perform um, some works in these white zones, white zones, that doesn't automatically mean that there won't be an archaeological excavation, but since we don't know the potential, yeah, there will be more like a follow-up of the works, and if we would stumble on some very important uh, archaeological findings, we always could be able, or sometimes we will be able to put the works to a halt in order to uh, perform archaeological excavations. Just recently, at the site of Turn and Texas, a uh, big site just in the north of Brussels, we discovered um, a, hmm, what's the beautiful word for that? A shitload of uh, Roman, uh, Rome, sorry, sorry. Okay, sorry. A, a lot of Roman remains. Uh, so the, there wasn't an archaeological clause, but the works were finished, so the works were put to an end, and we got 21 days to excavate the site. Really interesting findings of which the um, the results just uh, of which we are um, which we are still working on. So this is the atlas. When we put all these different communes together, we got more or less 900 mapped possible archaeological sites or sites with a lot of archaeological potential. This site, this uh, this map, excuse me, is um, accessible online on the. Um, on the cartographic website of the administration of town planning and housing of the Brussels capital region. So this website contains all of uh, different um, urbanization information concerning the, Brussels the, concerning the Brussels capital region and one of these la layers within that website is the archaeological um, layer. When you go to this WebGIS, we've seen it. We've seen it this morning uh, with other presentation, like in Poland, and there was another one in Albania, I suppose. It's a bit the same system. You can click on different um, buildings, and you get the metadata, get information about the site, what type of site, the date, brief description of the site, and we also left uh, a blank, a blank row where there should be a, a link towards the website. Because nowadays, all these atlases, as we call them, this, these volumes, are only in paper form. But by the end of 2016, if everything goes well, there will be this website, so people don't have to actually buy or consult or whatever these paper forms atlases. So this is what nowadays exists from WebGIS. Yeah, it's, it's, it's already quite impressive, but we can go further. And maybe some of you have noticed or not, the, um, the old city center of Brussels is shown by, by one pink zone. This is correct. This means that the old center of Brussels is, has a lot of archaeological potential. It's one big archaeological potential zone. That's true, but so this also means that whenever there's a, a um, an infrastructural work in town or a renovation of a building, there will be an archaeological follow-up. So this is a good thing. What is a pity is that the zone doesn't consist, consist of more detail. There isn't a, a more detailed level. So we don't have, like we have over here, uh, like I showed you, this fort. We don't have this kind of detail in town. Why is that? Well, quite obvious. We can't go and map every potential site in the center of Brussels. That's, this would take ages. So, like we've done for the communes, we can't work on the same way for Brussels. So, we took another approach. For Brussels, they also exist. So, for the town of Brussels, so for the historical town of Brussels, 
There also exists this atlas, which dates from 1997, so it's already slightly outdated. But in this atlas, we describe all archaeological um, our findings of Brussels. So all the excavation reports and the uh, important important objects are described in this site. Uh, excuse me, are described in this atlas. And in this in this atlas, all these archaeological um, excavations are also put to a map. But this ma map isn't is at the moment not yet uh, digitalized, which is a pity. But next to that, we also want to have these, this level of detail, this, 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 this layer within the system with some more information about, about buildings. So we decided since we can't work um, globally, since we can't, as I said, we can't map every possible um, lost building or every possible important historical building in once, we decided to work more thematically. So now we're creating these as we call them, since the name was chosen in 1991. Now we're creating these thematical atlases for the historical town center of Brussels. What do I mean by that? Well, within these thematical atlases, we're like um, analyzing different subjects um, linked to buildings of Brussels. Like we've made the first one, we've made on historic breweries between the 17th and the 19th century in the town center of Brussels. So all these breweries were mapped, and of each brewery, of course, we live in Belgium, quite obvious that we start with breweries. Um, <laughs> so for each brewery, we have the same metadata, like I showed with the, uh, like I showed for the communes, and there also will be a publication with more information about breweries in Brussels and uh, how they related one to one towards another. And, all the information around it. Next to that, we also did tests, okay, less brewery-like. We also did tests with monastery, although, <laughs> although. We also did tests with lost monasteries, and uh, not only lost monasteries, we also mapped all the monasteries and like the refugee houses, so all like um, clerical buildings at the end of the 18th century, so just before the uh, French Revolution. And we map all those sites, and this will be the second thematic atlas. At the same time, we're doing the same thing for the fortification in Brussels. So as you see, we're creating different layers, and one day, ah, within a year, we have like all these different thematic buildings uh, mapped. Not within a year for two years. Um, a small word on how we're doing this. We have in Brussels and in Belgium, also in the Netherlands, we have some fantastic uh, maps from the early modern period. <laughs> Problem is with these maps, we don't know a lot about their metric system, about how these maps were really, really created, or sometimes they even don't have a real metric system. And these maps were created before the middle of the 19th century, when those big infrastructural works started. So we had like the the creation of these big, uh, the creation of these big Haussmannian uh, boulevards, uh, the the um, the, how you call it, the covering of the river, the Senna. So there were these big wo uh, works which changed the, the view of town. So we can't link these ancient maps directly to the actual cadastre. So what we did is, very quickly, although it fascinates me a lot, but I don't have the time to go in very briefly, we georeferenced uh, more than 50 map layers of the oldest cadastral map of Brussels, so the map of 1821. And we vectorized every uh, parcel, every building, every attribute that was um, that was shown on this map. And this way, we have this early 19th century di digitalized cadastral map, which is georeferenced, which is linked to a real coordinate system. Yeah. And since this map is linked to the actual cadaster. And, so this is one, this map is linked to the actual cadaster, and this map is ma was made before the big infrastructure works. So this map shows more or less the town as it was at the end of the early modern period. So this map, which consists of yeah, tons of thousands of thousands of attributes like parcels, buildings, open spaces like gardens, 
road network, waterways, or fortifications, point features like wells and water pumps. So this map can be used to georeference those maps from the 18th century. Like we have over here a map from 1770. As you can see, especially the people here in front, you can see this, that this map can be almost um, perfectly georeferenced to this uh, 19th century cadastral map, which is, which is shown in red. So this is the vectorized form. When we put away the 19th century map and we put the actual cadastral on it, you see, except for this road, <coughs> There aren't any points of, of correspondence between this map. So we really need that 19th century cadastral map. So that way we hope, thanks to that 19th century cadastral map, create all kinds of thematic layers which we can put on. Yeah, the first idea was this WebGIS. The WebGIS of the Brussels government, which, ex which already exists. But the problem is, we have a lot of data. You heard we have all the data from the atlases. We have like all this new cartographic data, thematic layers, 19th century plan. Yeah, we fear a bit that when we put it on that website, which consists of tons of other cartographic um, layers from other departments, that this will get the, all our data will get a bit lost within all the other information. So that's why we decided to create a WebGIS completely um, completely for the, archeolo for the arche archaeological department. And that's why we haven't put it on this website yet. So this, is, this, this work, creating this web GIS, is actually linked to this one. So normally by the end of the year, the two uh, websites will be created. So this, how much? Three minutes, yeah, I think it will be six. <laughs> um, next to this uh, 2D, 2D uh, work, we also start working last year uh, with uh, more 3D images. Uh, until recently, we had complete coverage, uh, lighter coverage of the Brussels capital region. And of course, uh, yeah, people talked about it uh, this morning and even yesterday. This is very important for uh, rural areas, of course, but Brussels, except for some few, uh, few areas, is very urban. But we have like the, um, oh, excuse me, we have the Sonian Forest. Yesterday somebody talked about it. Uh, but Sonian Forest actually lays for most uh, of its part on the Brussels capital region. In the Brussels capital region. And there in that Sonian Forest we have the remains, which still are visible in the terrain, of a Neolithic um, fortification uh, of a Mechelsberg, I don't know, I think it's, a, it's the term is quite known. So of a Mechelsberg fortification within the forest. So we did excavations so over there, a lot of findings, but thanks to this LIDAR, as you can see here, the, um, the ditches and, the, and the, the, the ditches and ramparts are still vi are quite well visible. Normally you, you can, yeah, of course, uh, rotate this image, put other shade effects on it, hill shades and whatever you want. So the Im image can be more clear than what you see over here. <coughs> over on the south of this, we still have the remains of uh, two uh, Roman tumuli, uh, which are located near this camp. Next to that, so the normal lighter, most of the people start using it or using it even longer than we are using it. But we also have this this um, model, this, this uh, simplified model of the buildings in town. So this can be used as an informative way, as you see over here, we, we are giving, we've actually nowadays it's, um, yeah, there are, there are a lot more colors in it. It's, it's really the city center, so the UNESCO part of Brussels, and we give different colors to different facades, and every color is linked to um, a different date. Like for example, the blue ones are 17th century facades, and the pink ones are 18th century facades. So this helps in understanding, and also you can you can give like the different facades, like the front, the front facades, and the side walls, and the back wall. So everything it's 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 more um, easy to use than 2D image as always. And more important, maybe we start using this 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 3D model of town to <coughs> geo geo reference to to locate or excavation or excavations. So. Here you see a, a flat image, but of course an excavation is, is 3D. So here you see one of the layers 
But since this is a 3D view, we can put our different layers uh, uh, under each other. And I uh, already mentioned it, Brussels, um, yeah, it's a, there are a lot of buildings. There aren't a lot of open spaces anymore in, anymore in town. So a lot of the research in Brussels is building archaeology. But the way of, um, the way of understanding the, those 2D uh, technical drawings isn't always easy. So, I'm sorry, I, I only could put two views on it, but we actually can put all these um, technical drawings, like from this wall, from the roof, uh, from the, the cave, we actually can put all of this in this 3D model. We also can rotate it, just so it helps very much understanding how, these, how this building archaeology works. Um, so, this, this uh, about the slider, um, again, it's the, the results are still very preliminary, but now every uh, survey that is done is put within this, uh, it's actually, it's not a LIDAR, it's, it's a, the, um, a, la a laser scan model of the, the buildings. Last but not least, very briefly, uh, we're starting to, to experiment with, with 3D, uh, with, with experimental 3D. Um, we're not as far as some presentation that I've seen over here, but uh, it's, it's a path we also have to walk. I don't know why, the, why I left the question mark over there, because there should be an exclamation mark. 3D. Uh, so the, we only did one, one um, we only tackled one case study. Um, we did a survey, we did a, a study to the lost mansion, to the lost house of the Renaissance medicine, Andreas Vesalius, because there was an, an ex exhibition about this life, and I asked us, hey, uh, go and look for his house. Uh, and thanks to, oh, excuse me, thanks to cartographic, archaeological, all kinds, again, a multidisciplinary approach, because in our department we have archaeologists, we have historians, we have, uh, we have like these, these 3D specialists since recent, recent. And so, thanks to a multidisciplinary approach, we were able <laughs> to locate his house, which was completely lost. Nothing uh, remains from this building, because they built this small building on top of it, uh, the courtroom. <laughs> um, but we could locate it, actually, the building was uh, next to the, the place in front of the courtroom, the, the La Place, La Place Poulart. Um, so, and thanks to this, 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 this research and the, um, yeah, this, I, I don't know a lot about 3D, but uh, my colleague knows everything about it. We were able, thanks to uh, a lot of building archaeology with, with buildings from the same period and some uh, historical data, we were able to get <coughs> a, a proposition of how the building of Vesalius would have looked like. And I think I'll end my presentation. Uh, okay. still have tons of things that I want to say, <laughs> but let's keep it on this. So thank you very much for your time.